Welcome everyone to Expo North 2022, Boom Time, Scotland's production golden age is now. And we have a phenomenal panel here to investigate this very exciting time. I think just to lay the land a little bit for folks who are not in production, in the next four years, Scotland's screen production is supposed to at least double from what it is now. So there's a lot of activity happening. And we have a very interesting and exciting panel for you. We have Simon Pitts here, who's Chief Executive of ITV. Welcome, Simon. STV. STV, sorry, at STV. You had 17 years at ITV, is that right? I did, that's right. And before that, is it true that you were um, part of the European Parliament? You worked for the European Parliament? I worked in the European Parliament, not a career that is uh, any longer open to a British citizen. Wow, that's really interesting. As I understand it, given Brexit, but there we go. Times they are changing. Wow. And you had different roles at ITV and then now STV. So I'm really looking forward to diving into that with you. And Suzanne Simpson, thank you so much for joining us, executive producer of Masterpiece. And you're joining us from the States in Boston. I am. I'm in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, We haven't been in the office for about two years. So most of us are working from home still. Wow, that's so exciting. And Suzanne will dive into it too, but she's responsible for a lot of shows that are absolutely my favorites, like Sherlock, Victoria, um, Wolf Hall. So I'm I'm really looking forward to getting your perspective on the UK and Scottish production. We also have last but not least, Richard Talcart here, who's co-CEO of Buccaneer Media. Welcome, Richard. Hi there, Jess. And Buccaneer Media, is based in London, but it also now are going to have offices in Scotland. Is that right? We are. We're in, in the process of doing that. We've, we've teamed up with Do Grey Scott um, to set up Buccaneer Scotland. Uh, it's all in progress. There's a slate. There's even some exciting announcements coming soon about possibly our first show. So, yeah, all going well. Oh, that's so fantastic. And you're, um, for those who haven't seen it yet, Crime is amazing. It's one of your shows. And are you in the second season now for that? That kicks off production up in Glasgow in 29th of August. Yeah. Fantastic. So, and then our, it's an adaptation exciting. of Irvin Welsh's novel, an am- amazing Scottish production. So welcome everyone. Um, Simon, so, mean, can we start with you first? We're going to dive into a little bit about who you are and what you do at STV. Uh, well, that's a question that most of my colleagues ask every day <laughs> what I do at STV. Um, I've been the chief exec of SCV for uh, four years or so. As you say, I was at ITV for 17 years before that. Um, STV is is sort of the ITV of Scotland, but we're a separate uh, company, a separate PLC. We also have a separate um, digital streaming service, STV Player, which is available across the UK, thousands of hours of, of, of content. Wow. Um, and we run STV Studios, which is... Scotland's um, largest production company. I mean, until Buccaneer Scotland comes in, when I'm sure they'll they'll overtake us in the matter. Of <laughs> uh, but we six, make six to eight months. Six to eight months <laughs> or so, conservatively. Um, and uh, we make well. This year we'll make uh, 250 hours of new shows across mm. unscripted and scripted. Um, it is fantastic news that Crime has got a second season, and we were able. Um, uh, very recently to confirm that we had a second season two of of our new drama Screw, which we make for Channel 4. Also in Glasgow, we announced last week that we'll be back in the Kelvin Hall um, in Glasgow later this year, uh, which we're very excited about. Um, And yeah, I'm keen to talk about Scottish production and its boom because it's been a long time coming and now it really feels like we've got some momentum across the country. Which is really super exciting. Thank you, Simon. And we'll, we'll dive into that soon. I do want to mention for folks who do have questions, we are going to leave a little bit of time at the end for folks in the audience who do have questions. So please use the chat box. Um, and I promise I will get to those towards towards the end. Now, Suzanne, sorry, Richard, we are going to just go around in a circle. So you will, you will be last again. But first for my first question, Suzanne, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do at Masterpiece. Well, just... For this audience, in case you don't know, Masterpiece is on PBS and it's the longest running drama series in the United States, started 50 years ago. And it really introduced 
British drama to the American audience with mm-hmm. shows like I, Claudius and Foresight Saga and Upstairs, Downstairs and Helen Mirren in Prime Suspect and more recently, Downton Abbey. And we are right now uh, doing about 60 hours of programming on Sunday mm-hmm. nights. And we're doing it through commissioning new programs. We're doing a new Tom Jones. We're doing a show, Magpie Murders. And uh, we not only show our shows at nine o'clock on Sunday night, but um, we're now in the eight o'clock and 10 o'clock space also. Oh, interesting. Because there's so much good drama uh, coming out. And as executive producer, my first job is to commission programs, find great shows, develop great shows, just make sure that we have a slate uh, coming forward that people can be excited about. See, that's amazing. I do have to mention this because I think it's amazing and you're being very humble, but you personally, your work, two-time Academy Award nominated and two-time Emmy winning, which is pretty amazing. N- not, and that doesn't include the shows that you've done with Masterpiece that like Downton Abbey, I don't know how many Emmy nominations I had, but it's overwhelming. <laughs> I, you know, I started out as a filmmaker and yeah. I'm grateful every day for that because the kind of work that I do now is really reading scripts, you know, making judgments about how to make films better and all the rest. So that background has really served me well. And I'm thrilled to be on this panel, Jessica, because <laughs> Simon may not know this, but we presented Elizabeth is Missing. And I worked (laughs) many BAFTAs later, you know, and uh, we're thrilled having been the presenter of that. And Richard helped us uh, launch a show called Miss Scarlet and the Duke, which has become one of our most popular shows now. And uh, we continue to talk to Richard about doing other projects. So anyway, I'm thrilled to just be on the panel with both of you. That's such a fantastic connection. And that also perfectly leads to Richard. So Richard, can you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do at Buccaneer? Yeah, so Buccaneer is an independent production company based in in London, and as you pointed out, now now expanding uh, into into Scotland. Um, I run the company with uh, a guy called Tony Wood, um, and primarily we split our roles uh, with Tony running the creative uh, and me running the business. And um, along the way, we we sort of cross into each other's realms every now and then, and tip mm-hmm. our toes in and realize that the other one is better at doing that and so we jump out again um but uh we've had uh some some great successes lately which has been fantastic so we've we've, we've got five shows now that we'll be, be be going through and we've just wrapped on one of them um then we go go into production shortly on um a show called the burning girls which is a worldwide uh deal with paramount plus um after that we're going with season two of crime at the end of August. Um, and then following that will be announced, but uh, uh, no, in November we go with uh, another show for a streamer followed by um, a show in November, uh, sorry, in uh, February, uh, early February next year, um, based on the life of Leonard Cohen and his uh, relationship oh. with Mar- Marianne Island. So it's, yeah, it's a diver- diverse slate, but um, primarily I think we, we focus our efforts on, on on voice and um talent young talent often young female talent mm-hmm. um where we we don't think necessarily <clears throat> they always can find their way through so we we help them find their way through and guide them and shepherd them to writing the projects they want to write and hopefully people you know like what we do and uh, and we get green lights but um we, 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 we're getting there That's so great. And so before I dive into kind of the typical questions, like what stories are you looking for and give me a snapshot of where you guys are now, I want to dive into the heart of it because this is Expo North and Creative Industries Conference for Scotland. And Richard, you're kind of the perfect person to begin for this, but why Scotland? So you guys are busy enough. Why move to Scotland? Yeah, we are busy enough. Um, But I think the thing is when we we, uh, filmed crime uh, up in Scotland, and it was during the, you know, during various stages of, of the lockdown, which 
you know, once filming stopped, it allowed us a lot of time to think and talk and what are we doing up there and how can we do more? And we as a company, um, you know, we work very closely with Irvin. We're literally about to go out with uh, another of his books called mm-hmm. Sex Lives of Siamese Twins. It's not about that. Um, <laughs> uh, and um, we in in Irvin have a, you know, a sort of a, a hero of Scottish writing. Yeah. And um, when we were up there, we, we just realised that there was an enormous amount of very, very talented young writers and a, a rich history of literature. And when we yeah. dug into it further, we sort of, it became very apparent that on the SWOD services, the bigger broadcasters, the, the writers are predominantly from these aisles, English, and it didn't really make sense to us. So we felt that there was this opportunity up there to use the, the loud voice of, show, of people like Irvin um, for us to just shout out to everybody, uh, anyone listening now, that, um, <laughs> you know, we, we've done it before. We did it with, with Scandinavian writers when mm-hmm. everybody was sort of talking about Scandi Noir. Um, and again, predominantly, you know, English and American production companies were, were taking those as formats and then really making, you know, not as good versions in English language. And our view was, well, hang on, the Scandinavians tend to speak better English than the English. So why don't we get them to come and write in English? And those are writers that are, you know, they're schooled in Norse myth and we're schooled in Shakespeare and throw those two things together and you come out with a different voice. And uh, our feeling is that Scotland has its own voice, a very loud one, a very strong one, and it needs the platform with which to be able to do it. And between Tony and I, on the international side of things and Tony in the production space, we're, yeah. we, we feel we're a platform for those people. That's fantastic. And there's a hunger for Scottish stories. I mean, it, it's true. Audiences really, really resonate both in the UK and, and abroad. Um, yeah, it's, you know, I think a good example of maybe, so um, Jenny Fagan, the author, she's mm-hmm. working with um, uh, Irvin to um, adapt the continuation of Train Spotting, which uh, is the pilot, the pilot episode is is, is getting there. We're, we're sort of all waiting with bated breath to read it. And um, but yeah, we were again. We we're sitting there, and Jenny, Jenny's a, an incredible writer. And then you read, you know, Panopticon or Luck in Booth, for instance. And if if either of those books were written by uh, an English author, they would have been optioned ages ago and they they're, they're just stunningly spectacular books and so we of course have optioned them um and uh, and she'll adapt them for us but you know she she is to many i would say yeah. um in, in the, the the circles of writing scripts not very well known yet when you see her work and she's doing something alongside somebody like an urban welsh it's incredible. I mean, it's, it, it's, it is a completely different voice. It's writing I have never read before. And, and then it's in the power of the, you know, good commissioners to see that and understand that and, and hopefully see what is exciting, you know, on the page can, can come out on the screen. That's fantastic. And that's one of the many things I love about Buccaneer. You guys are very encouraging writers and writer voices so that you produce truly original feeling content, which I think is amazing. And I'm Thank a big, you. big fan. Um, and Suzanne, I, I'm clearly, I'm American. I've been in Scotland for 15 years. And the first window I had into UK culture was through Masterpiece. I'd watch it all the time, all the various shows. Um, so are, are you guys collaborating on any Scottish stories for American audiences? And what's, what's that like? Well, we are. And, um, you know, the opportunity really came, first of all, through Elizabeth is Missing and STV, mm-hmm. in that um, I had read an article in the New York Times about the show and about Glenda Jackson being in the lead. And I contacted the distributor and asked if it had been sold in the US and it hadn't yet. And so we mm-hmm. scooped it up and it was the first time I was introduced to Andrea Gibb, who who adapted the novel. And um, it was a wonderful production. And we decided to lead off our anniversary year, 2021, with that show, because it really represented a lot 
of the qualities that Masterpiece tries to put forward in our shows. Excellent writing, excellent acting, excellent production values, you know, something that our audience really looks for, something, and it was about something. Yeah. And those are the qualities that we look for, uh, for the shows that we want. And then the pandemic happened and five of the shows we expected to get for our anniversary year were locked down. And so I got on the phone to the same distributor who had found us, Elizabeth is Missing. And I started to, to ask for other programming. And I did this with all of our distributors. And the BBC came forward with a show called Guilt. And I'm hoping a lot of you have seen it because yeah. talk about original. Yeah. What an original show. And um, Neil Forsythe uh, wrote it. I, again, I hope I'm gonna be pronouncing these Scottish names correctly, but uh, Mark Bonner and Jamie Siv yeah. Yeah. were in it. And it's brilliant. I have, I have to tell you, our younger people on our team went crazy for it they loved it so we are we've already shown season one we're about to show uh, mm. season two this summer it oh. has Phyllis Logan from Downton Abbey in it. it you know again a great Scottish actress and so we're you know thrilled to have that show mm. and um, we also came in early on a show called Annika and I don't know if that's I take it that's been broadcast it was on uk tv so yeah. i just <clears throat> on, alib it? on alibi on uk tv it's a great show yes and that's um by a scottish company called black camel uh led by arabella mm -hmm. arabella cecil we didn't know arabella it was really through her distributor all three media mm -hmm. who brought us the project and so I, you know, just so people here listening today understand, sometimes producers bring us shows directly. But if we don't have personal connections, like we didn't before with STV, those projects often come through distributors uh, looking for a, a US partner in that way. But certainly we welcome production companies coming to us directly with any new projects they might have. But um, Annika, we did something different with Annika, which is that we decided to release it through our streaming platform first. It won't broadcast until the fall, but we released it because Nicola Walker is huge among Masterpiece fans. People love her. They'll look for anything that she's in. And within the first month of streaming, we had a million people who watched wow. it. Wow. wow. And so we expect to get three to five million people who will probably watch that show between broadcast and streaming between now and the fall. So um, streaming has, you know, really become important to us. And sometimes we lead with that uh, to build word of mouth. Well, and you also have a podcast, don't you? You guys have a podcast that kind of supplements the. Yes. And we, we, it's basically. Um, tied to all of our programming, usually to the episodes. So, um, you know, you're following along with the series uh, because it's a podcast, it's available worldwide. So it's the Masterpiece Studio podcast. So you can get it anywhere. That's, so that's so interesting. And I would be remiss not to say we actually have Neil giving uh, a keynote talk at Expo North um, tomorrow. So uh, folks can tune into that. He is a phenomenal writer. Um, Phenomenal. What, yeah. Talk about original voices, Richard. He really <laughs> has one. And um, I've so enjoyed uh, Guilt. And we're very, yeah. very proud to, to be showing it in the US. He also lives in the Highlands and Islands. So I just want to also reinforce the idea that you can live anywhere, especially the Highlands and Islands, and do, and do this work and be connected with the world. Um, so Simon, to you, I know that your role is a little bit different than Suzanne and Richard in the sense that you have 
you know, you're overseeing so much. You guys have a library of content that you're building. You're looking at expanding your audiences, but you have an understanding of Scottish audiences that we all don't have. So can you give us a snapshot a little bit at STV? What's happening there? What are your priorities? What are you guys learning about the way we're ingesting Scottish stories and content? Well, you're being very polite. What you're really meaning is that um, these two are program makers and I've never made a program in my life. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a modern languages graduate, which I think qualifies me to go on holiday, but that's really all it does. Um, so yeah, we, we, look, we have a we have a managing director of our of our studios business, um, David Mortimer, and creative directors across our all our genres who who really do know what they're doing. And and um, Suzanne makes a, makes an interesting point, I think, about uh, the likes of guilt and Annika, and of course, it's the same for for crime. Um, the reason these are important shows is because they are returning series okay. made in Scotland, and that's the thing that unites them, and the thing that as a production community, we have struggled a little bit with in Scotland in the last decade or so, and are now starting to really turn the corner because, you know, we, as you say, Suzanne had a, had a show called Elizabeth is Missing, um, written originally by Emma Healy, um, that really was a calling card for us. It was a fantastic standalone show, and we were tremendously proud of it. It wasn't necessarily a Scottish show, but we made it in Scotland because we were a Scottish business. Um, we also had another show called The Victim, uh, starring Kelly McDonald of, of, of train spotting fame, no less, <laughs> but many years back, uh, and now many other things. Um, and it was a four part show set in Greenock and Edinburgh. And it was a great show on BBC One, did really well, critically well received. But these are these were one offs. And so all the benefit of them which is, you know, a, a, a predominantly Scottish crew and cast, um, uh, lots of money into the local Scottish creative economy, um, but over a three or four month period while we're making the show. And then afterwards, people up sticks and um, potentially have to get on a plane or a train down south to get year round work because mm. there weren't enough returning yeah. series. And that's what we're all trying to put right. It's what... Uh, Rich is doing it at Buccaneer as well. And off the back of The Victim, uh, which is a sort of legal drama written by Rob Williams, Rob developed uh, Screw, which is now going to be in its second series for, for Channel 4. That's and so exciting. That's the, great. The, the big uh, plus of a returning series, as everyone knows, is that um, uh, you can develop new talent and you can give people a reason to come back or to stay in Scotland, in our case. And in terms of writing, Rob wrote all six episodes of Screw last time. He won't write all of them this time. We will bring on new writers. We have extensive training and development programs that we couldn't afford to do in a first series, which we can do in a second series, um, mainly because we don't have to build a prison set from scratch in Kelvin Hall this time around, because it's still up there, thankfully. And it is those returning series that bring the real benefit to, 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 to the local economies. Um, so we're very focused on that, including in unscripted. In terms of tastes, I mean, we also, we operate um, uh, STV, the TV channel, which, which is the biggest TV channel in Scotland. Um, I never tire of saying it's bigger than BBC One in peak time, really, <laughs> because it is. And um, we see very different tastes and viewing patterns. I mean, life, as, as, as all the audience will know, is, is, uh, is very different in Scotland to London and the South East. Um, work is different. Mm. Um, there are different viewing patterns, shorter commuting times. Um, people watch uh, more TV in Scotland than anywhere else in the UK, about an average of a half an hour a day extra, a nation of telly addicts. Mm. I reckon it's in part because it rains a lot up here, to be fair, although it's beautiful, it does rain. Um, uh, he, and we've discussed this before, Jessica, the Scottish audience is a huge true crime fans yeah, um, rather necessarily than costume drama, although unless Jessica has been involved in making the costume drama in which they will <laughs> flock to it in their millions. Um, uh, huge news and current affairs um, addicts. So our news at six is often our, the biggest show 
on TV in that week, not just on mm. our channel, um, uh, because it's local news and, 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 and current affairs. Um, big fans of quiz and um, daytime hits like The Chase, etc., cetera, um, and the soaps. More people watch Coronation Street and Emmerdale in Scotland than they do in Leeds and Manchester. Um, so tastes, expectations are, are different here. But of course, um, what we try to do is um, take the best of Scotland to the rest of the world. And that's what everyone else on this panel is trying to do, not just make yeah. Scottish stories for the sake of Scottish stories and for a Scottish audience, but bring and showcase the beauty, the talent, the writing skill of Scotland to the whole world. Yeah. And that's our opportunity ahead of us that we that we really hope to build on. Is there an ambition for STV, let's say over the period of this boom time this year, next two years, next three years, that you could share with us some some aims that you you are focusing absolutely. On? I mean, I've got the boring corporate aims, but at a, <laughs> at, a at a sort of on a sort of more creative or, and 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 our and we and we want to be a world class um, production company headquartered in Scotland that is making the biggest and best shows. Um, for not just terrestrial networks, but global streamers and international broadcasters. We've made a really good start there. We have a very exciting announcement that, um, that we're desperately trying to get out over the next couple of days, which I hope I wished had broken before, before this panel. Um, we want to be the UK's most respected nations and regions producer, mm -hmm. um, because if there's one good thing that has come out of the last six years of Brexit related turmoil and navel gazing across the UK. It's that the nation, the, the, the national networks have realized that they were too focused on London and the Southeast. They were not properly reflecting the diversity and breadth of, uh, of the audience across the whole of the UK. They didn't know what was going on across the whole of the UK. Otherwise many more people would have predicted what had happened. And if more people can see, hear their voices, see their environments, you know, recognize their communities um, on screen, uh, we'll be much better off um, uh, as, a, as a society. Um, and certainly that's one of our aims is to try to really big up the future of Scottish production across, across the whole of the UK and outside it. I think that's so great. And it on that exciting note, it would be kind of irresponsible of me not to ask this panel of people, and I don't mean to be undiplomatic, but what can Scotland do in order to encourage this growth and ease people's way in terms of producing here from tax, better tax incentives to better benefits, to better organization, to more line producers, which is what I've been hearing over and over again. Um, what have you found in terms of collaborating with Scottish productions or Richard in terms of your move? What, what, what can we do to um, pave the way and make it easier, make it better? Um, so, well, I, I think it just starts with the, the volume of production that's going on. So, I mean, it, it, it's great to have shows like Good Omens and Outlander mm -hmm. and things like that up in Scotland. But the reality is they're, they are little businesses on their own, basically. I mean, they, they take over a vast studio space. And mm -hmm. at some point, those shows will come to an end and they will leave. Um, and, and, and that leaves a void. So I think that there is the need for a slightly more sustainable approach. And with the awful events going on in Russia and a lot of production moving away from the US coming over this way, yes. there's a huge amount of pressure on stage space. You know, the, 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 there isn't enough. And yeah. um, it's an area that we're, we're looking at very closely now ourselves, um, having various conversations. But I think the, 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 the big point there is when it comes to building new studios is that the studio space that's available isn't then just out to the highest bidder mm -hmm. from a Netflix or an Amazon, because that's not going to, I think, bring sustainability long term um, to, the, to the Scottish space. And what you need is space for Scottish production companies, whether that be our, our own or, or, or others, to, to have the access to those, because they're never going to outbid Absolutely. the big shows for that space. So 
I think there's a need for uh, looking after your own uh, production companies. Um, and then on top of that is a, a, a proper training program that allows people that are coming, let's say, out of a degree that's related to the business, somewhere to go. Because if there isn't somewhere for them to go in Scotland, they're going to go south or across the pond. And if you've got facilities in place alongside these new studios and new stages and all of the, the stuff that you need to make shows up in Scotland, then you can create something that lasts for a long time and grows and grows and grows. Because, you know, we, we and this is not me saying this because of the panel I'm on, it was, it was hands down the best crew we'd ever worked with when we, oh, when we, made, when we made Crime. And okay, you've got in in Irvin, you've got you know he is who he is, and his stories are masterfully told, and the, therefore there was a huge passion to make that project the best it could be, and every single area of that crew was you know you could see they were just so focused on doing their job to the best of their abilities. So you know when you've got that there. You just want to grow and, and make that grow and, and use that enthusiasm and, and that pride to, um, to to bring more people into it. But there needs to be investment. Um, love better tax breaks. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, um, there's some pretty good ones out there these days. And yeah. um, shows, you know, more and more will be able to be made, made anywhere when you've got the, you know, the sort of, we've, we've seen it with the Mandalorian, but that technology is only going to get better and cheaper. Um, and, 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 you know, with the, the pressure we're all feeling in, in, in producing shows in terms of the squeeze of inflation mm-hmm. and the rising, the rising costs generally of crew, of, <clears throat> you know, every, every single area, I know this yeah. is starting to sort of, should I get the violin out and, and woe is me but um, it, it, it is a fact it's a reality that we're dealing with and um, you know crime as an example is 15% more expensive this season to make than it was last season and that's really? that is a, a real cost that is there um, so yeah I think it, it is about investment it is about the tax credit systems. It is about being competitive on the world stage because we're not the only business where it's become a worldwide business. There are no borders. There's nothing to stop us going to Lithuania, to, yeah. to wherever it is. And if you want to grab a piece of the business, and it's a big chunk of business out there at the moment, and it's going to go on for quite some time. I mean, there's a lot of services very hungry for content and stories. And if a Korean show can be the biggest show of the year where you don't even speak the language, then why can a Scottish show not be the biggest show of the year next year mm. where, you know, it's on Amazon or Netflix or whoever? Um, the, the, there is no reason it shouldn't be. It's only the scale of the ambition. And that's yeah. you know, that's up to everybody. If you want to, you know, if you want to be ambitious, everybody's got to get behind it from government, local government, central government, producers, broadcasters, if you really want to do it, everyone needs to come together and have sensible discussion and then act on it rather than talk about it. Absolutely. Um, and Suzanne, from the American point of view, what are the challenges of bringing Scottish stories over or, or are there any? Maybe it's easy. I, I will just echo the things that Richard just said. You know, I think it's about having excellent crew and I think it's about tax credits because right now that's how people are making choices about where they're going to shoot. Mm-hmm. And Ireland has done a very good job of offering terrific tax credits. So a lot of our shows have moved to Ireland as especially the streamers come into London and you know build studio yeah. and start to take up more of the crew. So I think there is a real opportunity for Scotland if they can do it, but they need to do it soon and they need to build on it to make it work. I think as a programmer, there's one thing, and I almost hate to mention it, but when a show goes international, um, you know, accents become a part of our judgment. Um, you know, our audience needs to understand what's happening. 
And um, I, what I love about the Scottish shows that we've done is that I think the actors themselves take great pride mm -hmm. in their country, in their language. But I'm just putting forward that <laughs> sometimes that can be a little difficult and is a factor in making a decision. Um, you know, I think we've stretched our, our limits. Um, but I also do think that more and more of the audience is accepting um, different language shows. And I, I think they can get used to it very quickly if the show is well made, you know, yeah. and, and the story grabs you right from the beginning. You're willing to make that investment. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And Simon, from your perspective, what can Scotland do to, to make this boom time better? Well, we've been, um, I agree with what my colleagues are saying, but we've, we've been campaigning for improved nations and regions tax credits for a while now. And this, is a, this isn't necessarily even a creative argument. This is a cold, hard economic argument that these make sense for the exchequer. So look at the high-end tax credit regime. They've made more than their money back on that over the last few years. It's been incredibly profitable. Why not add an extra 10% for shows that are made outside of London and the Southeast? How hard would that be if your overarching objective as a government, as this government says, is levelling up, yeah. is moving people around the country, which is absolutely the right thing to do? So... Um, I think that would work, but it would also work for the for the Treasury. Um, secondly, I think uh, there are quotas, aspirations, targets that have been um, mostly self-imposed by our big networks. I would like to see the success of a nations and regions strategy for the BBC or for Channel 4 or for ITV or for others measured over time in the number of returning series that are made in a place rather than the amount of money spent because we all know that it's easy to commit money to a show and watch it you know um disappear um but it's much harder to grow something that returns over time um and i think our success should be measured that way and then building on what richard was saying we have an amazing opportunity in scotland to build the best training and development scheme for our young talent um, uh, in the country. And what we actually do laudably is all of us do our own things. Yeah. So we run a, um, a training scheme, uh, a bursary scheme with the Royal Television Society, where we back 10 students from colleges and universities across Scotland every year in production, in news and in technology. Um, we back um, it's only open to individuals from lower income households because we think um, those are quite a lot of the people that are not finding their way into television for some reason. And we need different voices in this sector more than ever. Yeah. But think how good that scheme would be if it also included Buccaneer and Masterpiece and BBC Scotland and exactly. AN other um, uh, production companies that were making great shows in Scotland and we could cycle these students through an amazing experience over the course of a year or so and at the end of it I reckon given the demand for talent uh, in our sector right now everyone would get a job yeah so I just think we could be a bit more joined up yeah I think I think that uh, amen to that. I um I hope the powers that be are listening because that's very doable. I think one of the advantages is the size of Scotland. So we're not talking about such a huge place. We all know each other. You've already mentioned within there's so many concentric circles already before this panel began about collaborations and already working with people. So um so that seems incredibly doable as an ambition. I just wanted to mention because we are running out of time and I wanted people to be able to leave questions, um, please, if you do have questions for our panel, our wonderful panel, leave those in the chat box. I will read them out loud. So I have a question about Scottish storytelling and the Scottish stories that are either brought to you, Suzanne articulately pointed out, sometimes they're brought to her by sales agents, sometimes producers themselves. Um, you, you, everyone's talked about looking for a diverse group of Scottish voices um, and Scottish storytelling. When you're thinking, this is just an open question, when you're thinking about the stories that you want to commission or that you want to produce, 
are you thinking about audience first? So you're thinking about, okay, I know my audience and I know what they're going to want. Or are you thinking of showing the audience the way? So they haven't seen something like this yet, but they're going to like it. So it's like Ford, you know, if I asked people what they wanted, they'd say faster horses. Um, are you looking for things that have been successful in the past or are you looking for actually new, fresh voices? Wow. I, I have to say, I hope we're doing both. Okay. I do think there are qualities um, that our production share. And I think those qualities are that our audience loves female-led stories, mm -hmm. uh, strong women overcoming obstacles. Yeah. I think our audience loves stories with some humor, heartwarming, that we like our men heroic, <laughs> in terms of people who are fighting for justice. Mm -hmm. Those are some qualities. And I think those qualities can come to us in many different ways. Mm -hmm. So one show that's done particularly well for us, which you can imagine is All Creatures Great and Small. Yeah. Beautiful ensemble cast with humor, some romance, you know, kind of puts it all together in that way. But at the same time, I'm also looking at contemporary stories. We have one show now that we hope we'll be able to do that will have a strong female uh, black lead. Mm -hmm. um, older, it's an older character mm -hmm. and has a particular voice to it that I think will be great. Mm -hmm. And um, so I hope we do a little bit of both. We're lucky we're an anthology series, meaning we can pretty much program any show we want in Masterpiece. Mm -hmm. And we do look for those mainstream shows at nine o'clock that a general audience can watch. Mm -hmm. We also look at 10 o'clock where we've put some things that are much harder, much more graphic like Baptiste, if you happen mm -hmm. to know that show. Very gritty, but if there's a common thread, it's that it's well-written. So I would say for me, looking at programs, it is about the writing first. Okay. And if the writing's there, if the voice is unique and quirky, like it is with guilt, that will fit for us. Um, but it has to start with the writing. It has to be really of the highest quality for us to consider a project. Okay, Sam, thank you. Anybody else from the panel, the stories that you are honestly looking for? Adaptations. So that's more Simon in terms of stories you're looking for. I'm the one well, listening, taking notes. I mean, even exactly. So we, I mean, as a producer, we are in the business of solving problems for our commissioners um, mm -hmm. and making sure that we develop bespoke ideas for them rather than the scattergun approach, which maybe was what used to happen a few mm. year, years back. But you, I mean, even I know as a, as a, as a, as a modern languages graduate that it's all about, in, in scripted, it's all about the writing and all about the, the, that rare um, talent that you uncover in, in writer, writers. And I know that our team spend all their time nurturing relationships with writers that they believe in yeah. and you know we, we look at the um the relationship that we have with someone like rob williams who, who who started off on the victim and moved on to um screw for us and we just love working with him and we know that um we know that he's got many other ideas and that if we are um a good place for him to um, do his best work that he'll want to partner with us later for those ideas and of course um, we're always talking to commissioners about what what they want but generally we're trying to back talent and trust them and um, give them the backing they need to go and do their best work with us and in unscripted it's a different thing it's 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 also about ideas and people um, it's about formats returnability um, and we've moved away from um, one-offs and into shows that we think have a, have a long-term future for us. We're making 150 hours of shows about, about antiques next year, uh, five different shows um, from the same, from the same uh, uh, sub-genre and development team. 
Um, so it's also about um, knowing how to scale up when you've got an idea that works. Mm. Yeah, that, 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 is, that is true. Um, it's also, it's a long, you know, scripted is a long play. I mean, it, 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 you know, and I think, I mean, one of the most often heard expressions, I think, over my career has been, you know, we're not doing period at the moment. And, and yet, time and time again, period is there winning the ratings and um, it is a noisy show. And so we, I, I, I think I, I tend to sort of ignore a, a lot of the, what's currently, you know, what are we currently looking for? Well, if you start what you're currently looking for as a producer and you get into the development, by the time you're actually ready to pitch it, they're not looking for it anymore. So um, the uh, the way we go about it really is just about do we uh, do we like the story? Is the writer interesting? Is the voice slightly different? Is it clear? Because at some point it will go full circle, and that project, although maybe at the moment it's not something that people would be looking for, at some point it's it, it will find its moment, and that comes about by me speaking to Suzanne and 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 Simon and. and people and just making sure that you're sort of always in touch with them and, uh, and understanding the way that, that, that they're going, the way the market's going and, and what people are watching and where they're watching it. And, and from there, you can work out the best time to, to pitch a show. Absolutely. Um, I, 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 com I completely agree with that. So, okay, we have some questions from the audience. Um, so how well do you think are filmmakers aware of the knock-on impact of certain productions on other sectors in Scotland, for example, tourism? Does that come into play into your thinking at all? Um, I don't, no, I don't think about it. Um, I'm, I mean, I think it's, it, it, I don't know if I understand the question, question correctly, but I think in terms of the if you're talking about upping the tax credits um, to get big shows in that showcase Scotland, then you're, I'm pretty certain you're going to have a big positive impact on the tourism. So, uh, you know, but yeah. I think there's... Once, there, once you've I got a hit, you... once you've got a hit show, anything's possible. Yeah. So when you've got a hit show that comes back more and more, you know, you're... you're um, selling tickets to a tour of the Outlander set, you're, you know, it's it, 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 all, lots of doors open to you, but you can't ever start with the idea that you're going to create a franchise because it will, I would imagine, 99 times out of 100 completely bomb. You've got to start with a brilliant idea and back it. And then when you've got a hit on your hands, lots of avenues open to you, including mm. making the very best of where you are from a, from a tourism perspective or a viewer attraction perspective. Yeah. yeah. I, I do think for our shows, setting is always important. And I do think the shows that we've had, like Guilt, that really showcase Edinburgh, and uh, now with Annika, it really showcases Glasgow. I, I think the audience gets a sense of a place that may lead to an interest they didn't have before seeing that show. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And how much are you guys utilizing podcasts? as being part of your strategy to enter the world that you're, you're building? Well, it's a very busy sector. I mean, you know, it sounds like um, Masterpiece is making proper use of it. So I should, mm -hmm. I sh I should let Suzanne do it. But it's, it's, you have to really know your, know your stuff. If you're the, you know, the market is quite saturated already. So we focus our podcasts on the things that are our differentiators in, in Scotland. So we do... Uh, we do news, we do current affairs, we do weather. We've got a fantastic meteorologist who does a podcast about weather. Um, because believe it or not, there's a lot of weather in Scotland. People are interested. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, it is a very crowded space. I think when we got into it, really, we launched our, our podcast with the final season of Downton Abbey, which we mm -hmm. thought was our best shot at getting people interested. And that turned out to be the right thing to do um, because we got our biggest audience for that final season and people were very curious to talk to, you know, to hear Julian Fellows and to hear the, the actors. So it was well-timed. Yeah. I think since that time, we've begun to look at it as really something we offer the fandom of shows. These are the people who want to go deeper. Yeah. We don't yeah. 
expect that our podcast is going to get huge mainstream pickup because first of all, you have to be watching our shows to actually get something out of it. I think where we were also extremely lucky is that we found the right host. Mm -hmm. And this is a guy who used to write about television. He used to be a TV critic. He happened to be a masterpiece watcher his whole life. And the thing that I'm so proud of is that um, talent like an Angela Lansbury at the end of their interviews will say that's the best interview I've ever had. Oh, wow. wow. So for us, it's a source of pride that we can create an environment for these actors to really talk about their craft, to talk about who they are, the things they care about, not just about the character in that particular show. Mm -hmm. So um, it's really about exposing people to the craft of television. We love our interviews with writers, um, with directors. We've even gone so far as to have experts on Nordic noir talk mm -hmm. about why it, is this a genre that really people are loving. We did that when we did Wallander with Kenneth Branagh mm -hmm. that took place in Sweden. So we try to broaden it every once in a while, um, but it's it's working well enough for us and it's funded. So our, our sponsor funders funds it. So it's not a big worry for me to find funding for it. So. That's oh, Suzanne, that's fantastic. I am gonna be an avid listener. I cannot wait <laughs> to hear this. Um, so we have a couple of questions too about diversity. And one of them is about, um, there's all different kinds of diversity, age diversity, ethnic and cultural diversity. One of them is regional diversity. Simon, you mentioned a little bit about this, but when you're looking at stories, when you think about Scotland, there's so much regional diversity. There's the islands, there's the highlands, there's the lowlands, there's the borders, there's cities, there's country. How much, when you look at a script or story, are you thinking about location? and regional diversity. Oh, I haven't seen that before. I haven't seen that landscape before. And I think that's the nub of it. If it's something new mm. um, from a new place, from a new writer, a new perspective, that always excites you as a, as a, as a commissioner and as a, and as a channel. Um, and in general, around diversity, I think we've thankfully now as a sector and more broadly as a society, moved away from um, saying no to things like quotas and targets mm -hmm. and properly embracing quotas and targets across a whole range of different um, diversity issues. And that's a good thing because mm -hmm. that's how everyone runs their businesses on a commercial level. They all set themselves targets every day of the week and we hit those targets and drive our teams to get there. So why not do the same when it comes to diversity and, and in all its shapes. We haven't got to the point where we're saying um, we are going to um, commission a certain amount of shows from Dundee and Inverness and, uh, and Edinburgh, <clears throat> but we do do that in our news. So we have four different versions of our six o'clock news every night of the week. Um, and one is Glasgow, one is Edinburgh, one is Dundee, one is Aberdeen. And we have different news, different presenters, a different agenda, and uh, 130, 40 plus journalists who, whose task it is to gather news from all across the four corners of Scotland and its, and its islands. And that, for us, is our USP. That's reputationally what STV stands for. Um, we do that in our news, we do that in our current affairs, we have a relationship now with ITV where the vast majority of the commissioning decisions are made by ITV for our output on Channel 3. But where we can, in the regional opt-out slots we have, you know, at 8 o'clock on a Tuesday, 7.30 on a Friday, quite often on a Saturday and a Sunday, we go to great lengths to make sure we're representing the whole of Scotland. We have a show called Sean Scotland, um, where he... Um, visits all corners of Scotland in order to showcase craft and cultural um, uh, activities all across the country. And it's, it's in our DNA um, uh, and, uh, and long may that continue. That's really good to hear. And so interesting about the contrast between news and commissioning other kind of work. I'm, I'm glad somebody raised diversity because that in the, in the United States, 
um, we, it's important. We're, we've made a commitment to that. And we're really talking about diversity in terms of BIPOC. Um, mm -hmm. So for us, that's been an important element in each of our shows to find ways um, either through writers or through actors, directors, um, to really bring more of that to Masterpiece. And, uh, and we're very happy with the different ways that people have proposed that um, to us in their projects. So, in, in terms of the diversity question, and if you're talking about crews, I think we've, you know, crews and, and on screen talent, off screen talent, I think you've got to go again right back to the beginning of the whole thing needs a huge amount of investment from the start when people are learning a trade. And, you know, if, if that's not there at the beginning, then how is it going to filter through at the end to hitting these quotas? Um, because I agree with Simon, quotas are a good thing. If targets should be set, but you've got to give the quotas the best chance that they can get. And it's not going to happen overnight. Um, but there is little point in setting quotas if you're not laying the foundations at the beginning to allow for those quotas to be hit. Absolutely. Absolutely. I so agree with that. Um, and I, we are running out of time. So I'm so sorry for the folks who I haven't answered their questions yet. Um, there's so many and a lot more to be had. Um, I just have, I love ending with a little bit of advice. I always end interviews with a little bit of advice. And for folks who are not young, because there's a lot of people at various stages of ages at the beginning of their career. So if you're at the beginning of your career and you're in Scotland, you're a writer, you're an independent producer, you're a director, you're a cinematographer, and you're excited about this boom time, what can the individual do to make the most of this time? I know accessibility is a problem. Not everyone can approach you as individuals, but what would you recommend people at the beginning of their career do? to make the most of the growth of activity happening here. I hoped when you said advice that you were gonna give us some, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't dare, the audacity. <laughs> oh, I guess I'll start with this um, question because it comes up a lot. Yeah. And I think that we get unsolicited material from individuals all the time. I think that um, for a project to work for us, it's not just about the idea, it's also about the production company mm -hmm. and a company that has a reputation for being able to deliver a yeah. quality show. So we don't just take on a writer, we take on a production company. So I would say young writers, and I think maybe Simon um, has already said this, I think you need to be talking to production companies and talking to their development people about your ideas, see if there's interest enough to help you develop that further. Because eventually when you have something like that, you need to go with a production company to a broadcaster or to an investor or whatever way that you want to fund it so that would be my small bit of excellent advice and you know jess as you know because you're helping us to do it we're building a database of young not necessarily known mainly writers yeah. um that we are going to go through what will be a long process because the list is growing ever bigger so our voice is being heard about young writers coming out of the woodworks and having some confidence to come to a production company. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I will happily speak to anybody who's listening to this or listens to it in the future that um, if you're a writer and you're, you, you want to get in front of me as a producer, then, then get in touch with me. I mean, that, that's, that, that's as much as I can sort of do. I mean, is that there's an element of this, which is up to the individual to, to, to you know get up and, and, and make something happen but the reason for setting up Buccaneer Scotland was to give you know people a chance to come and say this is what we do and this is how we do it and we've got many many experienced writers on our books that are more than happy to help as well um, in giving advice and you know if we can attaching young writers to a show where they can write and be overwritten by uh, bigger writers if necessary 
Um, but you know, when we we did this before in um, uh, went to see a play in Leeds that was written by a 25 year old woman, uh, and we asked her if she had anything she'd ever wanted to write for television, and she wrote it pilot script in a weekend and we pitched that in the US and it was a bidding war between HBO Max and Amazon. So what a cool story. That's amazing. Uh, you know, that, that's but that's you know as, as Suzanne was saying, you, you've got to you've got to if you are a writer or you've got to come at it with a production company and you've got to have a bit of you know weight behind you. But you the first thing is allowing your voice to be heard so that somebody can then take it to the next stage. That's great advice. Thank you, Richard. That's really good. Simon. Yeah, look, well said. I mean, uh, I, I would say similar, get in touch. I mean, we are a, a sector full of people who like giving out advice and, and the sound of our own voices. <laughs> and I really, I, I don't know many people in our sector that if you emailed them and said, I'd love to get your advice on something or would you have five minutes to um, talk to me about it? I don't know many people who would ignore that. I certainly wouldn't. And uh, I'm, but yeah, I'm surprised at how few, few people actually do do that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what I, I don't mean send a random script to a commissioner, which is sort of what um, Suzanne was referring to. That, that is tricky. I mean, contact a production company and say, I think I've got something here. And our team, our development team, would always pick up the phone and would always have a chat. Yeah, that's great. Simon, thank you. Simon, Suzanne, Richard, thank you so much for being part of our panel, giving us your time, your insights. You guys have been incredibly generous with your advice and also very inspiring. And I hope the powers that be have listened in terms of what your wishes are for um some improvements in Scotland to make this boom time even better and really reach that golden age. So I cannot wait to see all the things that are in development that you're working on. And thank you so much for joining Expo North. Thanks so much, Jess. Thank you. Bye, Simon. Bye, Simon. Bye. Bye-bye. See you soon. Bye.